My name is Steve Zeltzer. I'm with Lapio Labor Education Project and AFL-CIO International Operations. And we're having a panel today report on what's going on in Colombia and Peru, and also the history of the AFL-CIO in Latin America. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. And our moderator is going to be Professor Carol Lang, who is a uh, professor at CUNY College will be moderating it. So thank you. And Carol. Yeah, I also wanted to thank everybody for coming to this discussion on the AFL-CIO's complicity with American imperialism. Um, we belong to an organization called LAPAIO, the Labor Education Pro Project on the AFL-CIO International Operations. And we'll be discussing the Solidarity Center, AFIL, and its relationship to what's going on in, in Colombia and Peru. Our speakers will be Jeff Shirky, who is an author of Blue Collar Empire, The Untold Story of U.S. Labor's Global Anti-Communist Crusade, James Jordan, Global Alliance for Justice, Frank Hammer, um, who is the past president of UAW, Local 909, and Professor Kim Sipes. Sorry. Um, this panel will look at the history of the role of the AFL-CIO in Latin America with a focus on Colombia and Peru. Um, prior to the formation of the AFL Solidarity Center, which is primarily funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, the American Institute for, for Free Labor, which preceded it, um, free labor development was directly funded by the CIA and played a critical role in U.S. coups and imperialist operations in Latin America. There will be reports not only uh, on this history, but the labor struggles today in Peru and Colombia, where the injured workers, which is what Frank is going to be talking about, the GM workers, had an encampment in front of the U.S. Embassy in Bogota for over 11 years. Um, and I'm sure Jeff will go into the history of uh, the Solidarity Center and how much money they get, so I don't have to reiterate all of those numbers. I just want to say that um, that we have a website, and we would like to introduce everybody to the website, and we're going to be having future discussions. That's, we're going to have one in October 26th on the History Journal and its relationship to um, to American labor movement. So without further ado, I thought we would I would introduce Jeff first to give an overview about US imperialism and then um, you know allow Frank and um, James to to talk about the specifics of what was going on in Colombia, Peru. Well thanks everyone. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the introduction. So yeah, I'll just talk about the uh, sort of long history of the AFL and later AFL-CIO's um, attempts to control and influence the labor movements of Latin America. Um, and, you know, we have obviously Kim Sipes uh, can speak a lot to this history as well. I see Rob McKenzie is on the call, who's also written uh, an important book called El Golpe about A-Field's involvement in Mexico specifically. Um, so we have a lot of experts here uh, in, in this meeting. But so I'll go back to you know the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The labor movements of Latin America had followed a kind of revolutionary style of organizing um, sort of anarcho-syndicalists seeing unions as a vehicle for revolution, similar to the labor movements of Spain and Italy, while the U.S. labor movement also had a lot of radical tendencies, including anarchist tendencies in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but by the early 1900s, the AFL, American Federation of Labor's style of pure and simple conservative trade unionism kind of came to dominate the US labor movement. Um, and the AFL's involvement in Latin America kind of started, uh, you could say after the Spanish-American War in 1898, when the United States took control over Puerto Rico and Cuba, and the AFL hired uh, Santiago Iglesias to be its main organizer uh, on those two islands, Puerto Rico and Cuba. Iglesias was a Spanish-born uh, Puerto Rican cabinet maker and lab labor activist 
who in the early, early 20th century was sort of the AFL's main uh, organizer for Latin America. And then roughly a decade after the Spanish-American War, during the 1910s with the Mexican Revolution, workers um, all around on both sides of the U.S. and Mexico border were organizing um, with the industrial workers of the world, you know, more radical kind of left-wing class conscious labor movement that was a rival of the AFL. And AFL leader Samuel Gompers, along with President Woodrow Wilson and Wilson's administration, wanted to try to temper the radical impulses of the Mexican Revolution, particularly within the Mexican working class, and wanted to drive them away from the IWW. Um, and at the same time, in Mexico itself, the constitutionalist faction in, in the Mexican Revolution also wanted to establish a more kind of bureaucratic, efficient trade union model um, similar to that of the AFL and, and try to sort of pull the Mexican labor movement away from anarcho-syndicalism. So in May of 1918, the constitutionalists in Mexico founded the CROM, which is what is the Regional Confederation of Mexican Workers. And only six months after that, the CROM partnered with the AFL under the direction of Samuel Gompers and with the support of President Woodrow Wilson to uh, create a new inter-American labor organization, which they called the, the PAFL, the Pan-American Federation of Labor. It was founded in Laredo, Texas in late 1918. Primarily the AFL and CROM in Mexico were the uh, the, the main bodies that were part of the PAFL, but there were also union representatives from Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, and Colombia. Um, the AFL was really pretty much in charge of the, the Pan American Federation of Labor. Gompers served as the president of the Pan American Federation of Labor. A lot of what it focused on was questions of immigration, of you know Im immigrant workers coming from Mexico. And it was also calling for better treatment of workers across the whole Western Hemisphere. But the real central purpose of the PAFL was to counteract the radical tendencies in the labor movements of Latin America, especially in Mexico. And Santiago Iglesias, the AFL's main representative in Puerto Rico, who I mentioned before, um, was sort of the main driving force of the PAFL. And he explained that the point the whole purpose of the PAFL was, quote, that it was meant to be, quote, an instrumentality through which constructive trade unionism can gain ascendancy in Latin America, thus saving the U.S. trade union movement from a continuing battle at its back door with a most destructive and revolutionary labor movement. So really just trying to, again, water down and make, you know, spread this sort of uh, pure, so-called pure and simple business union model of the AFL into Latin America. Uh, in 1924, Samuel Gompers, who was president of the AFL and of the PAFL, died uh, of heart failure actually in San Antonio, Texas on his way back from a PAFL meeting in, in Mexico City. And with Gompers' death, the PAFL became a lot more inactive and was more or less just a paper organization for the next few years until it kind of fizzled out in the 1930s. But meanwhile, then in 1936 in Mexico, um, the Marxist union leader uh, Vicente Lombardo Toledano founded the CTM, the Mexican Workers Confederation. And although the CTM would later become associated with corrupt company unionism, you know, charro unionism, in its early years, in the late 30s, the CTM was actually a pretty dynamic, militant, class conscious union federation sort of similar to what the CIO was in those days in the United States. And under Lombardo's leadership, the CTM helped to nationalize Mexico's railroads and oil industry. And in 1938, the CTM under Lombardo's leadership brought worker organizations from 13 different Latin American countries together in Mexico City to found a new regional labor organization called the CTAL, the Confederation of Latin American Workers, which uh, welcomed in leftist communists, um, was explicitly opposed to Yankee imperialism, 
and that was led by Latin Americans. So it, basically this new Confederation of Latin American Workers supplanted the previous Pan-American Federation of Labor that had been dominated by the AFL. And the Confederation of Latin American Workers really was of, by, and for Latin American workers. So naturally the AFL was pretty upset about this, but this was in the 1930s, the period of Franklin Roosevelt's good neighbor policy of non-intervention in Latin America. So there wasn't a lot the AFL could do about it at the time. But a few years later, at the end of World War II, um, U.S. foreign policy shifted away from the good neighbor policy as the Cold War started to begin. And um, uh, it was AFL leaders saw this as a politically opportune moment to, to, to wreck this, the Confederation of Latin American Workers, to divide it through red baiting and trying to create a new anti-communist and AFL dominated hemispheric labor organization like the old PA, PAFL. So to do this, to, to basically destroy the Confederation of Latin American Workers in 1946, the AFL hired Serafino Ramawaldi to the newly created position of AFL Inter-American Representative. Now Ramawaldi was originally from Italy and he was an anti-fascist who opposed Mussolini and it was because of his opposition, opposition to Mussolini that he had to flee to the US in the 1920s, but he was also strongly anti-communist when he was in the U.S., he worked for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, uh, their communications department, because the union had many Italian members. And during World War II, Ramwaldi traveled across South America on behalf of the U.S. government to do anti-fascist propaganda work within Italian immigrant communities in countries like Brazil and Argentina. And so along the way, he learned, he learned Spanish and he developed many contacts across Latin America. And then in near the end of World War II, after the fall of Mussolini from 1944 to 45, Ramualdi was back in his home country in Italy, working for the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the wartime intelligence agency that preceded the CIA. Um, but he was only there with the OSS for a year, and then he returned to the US to his job with the ILG, and then he became the AFL's Inter-American representative. And so between 1946 and 48, Ramualdi was traveling all around Latin America, and he was supported by the State Department and the different uh, labor attaches at U.S. embassies across Latin America, convincing different union federations to break from the, the more left-wing uh, Confederation of Latin American Workers, um, again, using red baiting, saying, you know, that they're allowing in communists, they're uh, tolerant of the Soviet Union, et cetera, and sort of using these Cold War politics to to convince uh, workers' federations to want to uh, split from the Confederation of Latin American Workers. And one of the first ones to do so, to actually break with the Confederation of Latin American Workers, was the Peruvian Confederation of Workers. And the Peruvians in, in January of 1948 hosted a conference in Lima for the Western Hemisphere's anti-communist union federations including the AFL, to found yet another new uh, regional organization called the CIT, the Inter-American Confederation of Workers, to be a rival to the more left-wing uh, Confederation of Latin American Workers. And this was all engineered by Ram Waldi on behalf of the AFL and the State Department. And then four years later, the CIT was reconstituted as ORIT, the Inter-American Regional Organization of Workers, basically the pro-U.S. anti-communist regional labor federation that supplanted the Confederation of Latin American Workers. And then throughout the 1950s, Ram Waldi continued working with the State Department and the CIA to undermine the more sort of left-wing, class-conscious uh, worker movements across Latin America. One of the most famous examples, of course, was Guatemala, the General Confederation of Guatemalan Workers was led by leftists, and they were allies with democratically elected president, reformist president, Jacobo Arbenz. Arbenz was infamously overthrown in a CIA-sponsored coup in 1954 because he wanted to implement an agrarian reform program, which angered foreign multinationals like the United Fruit Company. And the AFL and Ramualdi backed the coup uh, in part because they wanted to get rid of the General Confederation of Guatemalan Workers, this leftist-led 
labor federation in the country. So the AFL with Ramaldi's, you know, Ramaldi as the main uh, person uh, in charge financed this guy in Guatemala called Ruben Fiatoro, who was uh, started a small anti arbenz group called the Union of Free Workers. And members of this group, including Viatoro himself, participated in the coup when it happened in 1954. With, again, this particular group was supported by the AFL. And Romualdi seemed to be in on the CIA coup plot. Um, a document I found in the archives was a letter from him to the AFL leaders just a few weeks before the coup in Guatemala, where Romualdi wrote, that there was, quote, reason to believe that the last word on Guatemala has not yet been spoken. And he continued, quote, extraordinary events are likely to occur in the very near future with the possible result that the communist influence in the government will be wiped out for good. So he kind of knew what, what was going on. We can, we can surmise that he was, you know, in the loop with the CIA and others uh, on this, the overthrow of Arbenz. And then after the coup, Ram Waldi traveled to Guatemala. He tried to put this, you know, this guy he'd been he had been backing Ruben Viatoro in charge of a new labor federation. But of course, the military regime that had taken over wouldn't tolerate really any type of union movement, not even a AFL style pure and simple business union movement. Um, by the time of the 1959 Cuban Revolution, the AFL and CIO had merged. And in response to the Cuban Revolution, the Kennedy administration started the Alliance for Progress, this program to give billions of dollars in military and economic aid to anti-communist Latin American governments in the hopes of preventing, preventing more Cuban revolutions from happening. And AFL-CIO officials proposed uh, at this time a new training project for Latin American unionists to be like the labor arm of Kennedy's Alliance for Progress. And by 1962, this proposed training project was in operation known as AFIEL, the American Institute for Free Labor Development. Um, AFIEL was supported not only by the US government, but also by various US, US corporate executives who had business interests in Latin America, like J. Peter Grace, head of the W.R. Grace Corporation, a US conglomerate with over a century of involvement in Latin America, a lot of it notorious involvement of exploiting Latin American workers, Grace became the chair of Afield's board of trustees and other corporate executives were on the Afield's board. And Ram Waldi was tapped to be Afield's executive director. So Afield would be the AFL-CIO's most significant foreign operation during the late 20th century. It received hundreds of millions of dollars from the US government, particularly from the US Agency for International Development, and later also from the National Endowment uh, for democracy, and it was almost certainly working in close cooperation and coordination with the CIA. Many of AFIELD's leaders were reputed to be CIA agents. AFIELD focused on training programs, uh, labor education programs within Latin American countries, but also brought select groups of Latin American union leaders to Washington, D.C. for a more advanced training school. And later it was moved to Front Royal, Virginia, and then later again moved to Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, the trainings focused on business union types of, uh, you know, uh, contract negotiation and grievance handling and, and stuff like that, but also a lot of tips and tactics on how to keep leftists and anti-imperialists out of unions. They would do like role plays where they would uh, rehearse what it would be like if you were in a union meeting and a leftist started speaking up and talking about Yankee imperialism and how to shut them down and tell them to shut up and go away. That was the kind of things the Latin American unionists were learning in AFIELD's training programs. AFIELD also had a social projects department doing small scale community development programs like building health clinics and work community centers and setting up worker co-ops and things like that across Latin America to try to, this is part of the battle for hearts and minds, trying to entice workers to side with the more anti-communist pro-US unions. And especially prominent was AFIELD's worker housing project program, which lasted until the late 1970s, where they would build affordable worker housing projects in 
overcrowded cities across Latin America. But this was often controversial because Afield didn't always deliver the number of housing units pro as promised, or construction would be delayed several months or years. And only members of the ORIT affiliated unions, the pro US unions, could move into these housing units. And reportedly, to apply to live in one of any of these Afield housing projects, you had to fill out a lengthy questionnaire asking all kinds of questions about your union and the politics of your union leaders, uh, things that had nothing to do with your housing needs, but was clearly designed to like provide intelligence to the US, uh, to the CIA, et cetera. And Afield was most infamously implicated in several CIA-sponsored coups and destabilization campaigns uh, between the 1960s and 80s, uh, or even early 90s, targeting uh, left-wing labor movements and left-wing governments in Latin America. Uh, there was a lot of examples um, that uh, I, I talk about in in my my new my new book that was mentioned, Blue Collar Empire. Um, but so I won't go over all of them. But one famous example was the Brazilian coup in 1964, where the uh, progressive president Joao Goulart was overthrown by the military with full CIA U.S. support. A year before the coup, Afield had trained a special all Brazilian class of like 33 union members, all from Brazil. Um, and many of the graduates of that training class were involved in the coup and the, and the aftermath of the coup. When the new regime took over several Brazilian unions, they sent in trustees or they called them interveners to purge Brazilian unions of, of all leftists or sympathizers with Goulart, the president who had been overthrown. And the, it was the Afield graduates who were um, who were who were these actual trustees or interve interveners conducting these these purges? Um, one of Afield's top officials, Bill Doherty, openly bragged not long after the coup, saying our own graduates were involved in the clandestine activities um, that led to the to the coup. Another example: the 1973 Chilean coup against Salvador Allende, which uh, you know, of course, very famous or infamous. In the run-up to that, Afield was supporting uh, gremios, these associations of middle-class professionals, not quite really unions, professional so associations, including engineers and the copper mines, um, shopkeepers, physicians, truck owners, and operators, and worked with Afield worked with the CIA uh, to fuel anti-Ende strikes uh, that these gremios were doing uh, that created havoc in the Chilean economy and gave General Augusto Pinochet, the pretext to, to take over. And then in the 80s, Afield was working with the Reagan administration to support the counterinsurgency wars in Cent Central America, trying to undermine the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, as well as putting up lots of money into propping up anti-left centrist politicians and unions in El Salvador uh, and backing a limited land reform program in El Salvador that ultimately was was killed by the Salvadoran right. Um, but in the 80s, there was a major backlash from the US labor rank and file uh, protesting Afield and the AFL-CIO's involvement in Central America and support for Reagan's foreign policy. And because of the rank and file organizing and, and uproar that several national union presidents from within the AFL-CIO created the National Labor Committee in Support of Democracy and Human Rights in El Salvador, which was a group that supported the more militant trade unionists in El Salvador who were facing violent repression and organized for an end to US military aid to El Salvador and to the Nicaraguan Contras. So by the 90s then, um, when new leadership took over the AFL-CIO in 1995, Afield had earned a pretty negative reputation um, so it was shut down and then rebranded really as the Solidarity Center in 1997, which still exists uh, to this day. It's still the AFL-CIO's sort of international face. Uh, it's active in 60 countries around the world. Um, and it was said at the time that the Solidarity Center was a break from the past, a break from AFIELD, but it is still funded primarily by the State Department, by USAID, the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, the same government entities that were funding AFIELD. Um, I have 
the most recent um, numbers that I've found for, are from 2020, where the Solidarity Center had $42 million in total finances. And of that $42 million, $38.8 million, almost everything came from federal grants, including $22.6 million from the National Endowment for Democracy and $14.9 million from USAID, only $300,000 from the AFL-CIO itself. So it's still um, essentially uh, an arm of the U.S. government more than an arm of the AFL-CIO. And uh, there's a lot of questions I think folks probably have um, about the Solidarity Center. So I'll leave it there. That was a lot. And I'm sure there's there's a lot of things I left out, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. James, are you ready? Sure. And uh, yeah, that was a great presentation. Uh, got me, uh, spurred me to thinking as you're going on, I was like uh, doing some searches for some things that came up, you know, so, so it was really good. Thank you. Um, well, First of all, let me just say that I do have uh, some really close and good contacts in Peru, and I've had some uh, connections with the labor movement there, uh, especially more in the past. I was, uh, it, you know, about 10, 10 years or so ago, uh, working a lot with some of the miners unions uh, regarding some issues uh, around the proposed uh, gold mine expansion in Cajamarca and also the Tia Maria copper mine down in uh, southern Peru, um, which is a mine that is being expanded without consultations of the people, you know, in uh, violations of union rights. This is a mine owned by uh, or being proposed. It would be uh, run by Grupo Mexico, which uh, has operations in the U.S., Mexico, and Peru. But um, anyway, I just want to say that I have much more connection with uh, Colombia and know more about Colombia than Peru. So I'm going to be a little bit short on, on Peru, but I will discuss it a little bit. Uh, I am with the Alliance for Global Justice, uh, where I've been working for the past 17 years. And for about 15 or 16 of that, one of my primary areas is, of focus has been on Colombia solidarity and especially with some of the unions there. Um, we started out our Columbia Solidarity work working a great deal with the Fensuagro Union of uh, Farmers and Farm Workers. And it's one of the three unions that has uh, <clears throat> been most affected by threats and uh, killings of union leaders, and certainly the union that's been most affected by dis forced displacement. Uh, we have also worked very closely with Sintrain Tobacco, Tobacco Workers Union, uh, with Sintep, the uh, union of uh, human rights monitors in the uh, Ombudsman's office, with the Sindicato Memoria Viva, which is the a union of former guerrillas, peace accord signers who are now working as bodyguards for the government of Colombia. And um, the steel work, or not the steel workers, but the USO oil workers and other uh, workers, uh, FACODE, a variety of unions. I would say right now there were special, and, and of course we worked with the Asotrico, uh, the injured workers that Frank will talk about. Right now I'd say we're especially close with CENTEP, the human rights monitors, and with Memoria Viva. Uh, and the bodyguards, and they are part of Sindet or of Redsipas, the Labor Network for Peace. It's a network of all the different unions that are working to implement the peace process through various quote, government agencies. And uh, we're bringing them on tour, uh, trying to set up a tour in uh, January and we'll be hitting both the East Coast and the West Coast. So if anybody is interested in that, they can get in touch with me. I would love to talk to you. Um, when we're talking about the Solidarity Center, um, the largest amount of money at this particular moment, if I understand correctly, I was looking through some figures yesterday, 
goes towards Latin America. Um, there's other, you know, almost almost as much, you know, other sections of the world, but right now uh, Latin America is the largest. And another thing that I'll say about the Solidarity Center activities in Latin America, in Africa, uh, that they are very much, they're not just about Latin America and Africa, they're very much about uh, blocking uh, the progress that uh, China is making, especially also Russia, other countries, in challenging U.S. hegemony, economic, military, you know, but, well, not to, they're, they're not really challenging the military hegemony, but definitely the uh, economic hegemony in places like uh, Africa and in Latin America. And uh, oftentimes, you know, usually, you know, uh, whether their activities <clears throat> Are particularly positive or not, they do not go in with the arm twisting and the threats and the interference that always accompanies U.S. Uh, corporate expansion. And um, we can see this. I know I'm talking mostly about Colombia and uh, Peru, but for instance, we look at Mexico. Uh, Mexico just got like a huge, uh, something like $10 million grant coming from the Department of Labor and the Solidarity Centers, one of their main people in Mexico is a guy named Fred Hermanson. And he was in Haiti in 2004 when the, or when the overthrow was going on against uh, Aristide. And before that, he was an expert in China. He's fluent in Mandarin. And if you look at the grants that the NED is getting, you look at how uh, money USA to spending, you look at a lot of labor activity and much of it, much of it is going to have to do with uh, China and Russia. So I'm just in, it, emphasizing right that, right that right now to make the point that Latin America is very much a microcosm for the entire world and for the struggle against, uh, against imperialism and militarism around the world u.s nato militarism it is it is very much that so it's not just about latin america by any means <clears throat> i think when we're talking about well i i'd like to just start with haiti uh if we're going to talk about what i've seen in in south america because in haiti we see certain patterns that were that i felt <laughs> that we're seeing emerge with my travels. We had, uh, during the coup against Aristide, you had the right wing, the International Republican Institute, leading that coup, fomenting that coup. But meanwhile, the Solidarity Center was spending its money supporting a ultra-left uh, organization of workers who refused to, do, to defend the elected government at the time of the coup, and in fact, in fact, were joining with the call for Aristide to, to sit down. In Haiti, following the coup, the Solidarity Center, they completely ignored the CTH, the Coalition of Haitian Workers, at a time that they were being killed, threatened, and forced into hiding. But after the dust settled, they came in with hundreds of thousands of dollars to give to the state CTH, and their nature and personality and character changed drastically. They joined the Preval government. They had previously been major supporters of Aristide, but they joined the Preval government and the election council that put its seal the U.S. demand that Lavalas not be allowed to participate in those elections. Following that coup, after the dust settled, I visited Haiti too, but what we saw and heard a lot about was how the U.S. was going in with funding and funding really good grassroots popular organizations. But in the vacuum of the disappearance of Lavalas, what they were creating was dependency and co competition for resources versus unity. And this fomented splits in the Haitian left that exist to today and Malays. We saw similar patterns, of course, in Chile, 
with the way the AFL-CIO and A-Field played the left side of the coup led by Pinochet. We saw this in Venezuela in 02 in the attempted coup against uh, Chavez. I'm worried that we're seeing this right now in uh, Peru, well, well, in Colombia. I'm worried about this because, and I want to say that I believe that we could call US strategies in Latin America and everywhere to be a matter of tame or top, or tame and topple. Because I believe in Colombia, we see, we see the right wing, the far right of the U.S. supporting a far right of the of Colombia that is aimed at toppling, at bringing down Petro by any means necessary. We also see a less, a more centrist U.S. Uh, government functionaries, the Democratic Party, the Biden administration focused more on trying to tame the excesses of an administration that's challenging its policies towards Venezuela and towards the drug war, calling for an end to the drug war. And we also see the Biden administration, I won't go into it, but playing both sides to it. At the same time, they're going for the tame. They're also engaging with the top. Okay, I won't go into that right now, but I've written some about this. But I believe right now there's a ramping up of right-wing activities of attempts at lawfare against the Petro administration, and it accompanies activities that I believe that split and divide the labor movement. And I cannot say to what extent the Solidarity Center is involved, but I know the Solidarity Center is very active throughout Colombia, and its presence has accompanied, for instance, a turn of the coot, the major left confederation in Colombia of a turn of the coot towards the right, for instance. We also see its functionaries very, very, very active in the Ministry of Labor within pe the Petro administration. And this creates an interesting dynamic because right now you have right-wing unions that are leading a strike against the Ministry of Labor. It's a right-wing strike. It's people that are limit or that are allied with the right wing. Uh, you know, right, the corporate with the oligarchy is what I mean. You see that happening. On the other hand, though, you see the Ministry of Labor turning a cold shoulder to some of the most grassroots and left unions. And they should that they should be engaging. And we're seeing this with a raid surpass with the Memoria Viva, who have, uh, you know, who are dealing with a great deal of um, threats, of obstacles against them, and they're not getting the, the open doors or the support they need from the Ministry of Labor. Uh, nevertheless, the Ministry of Labor is much more open. Nevertheless, you know, despite all this, despite the problems, they are definitely more open and approachable, especially for ourselves as a solidarity activist. But I'm just saying that I'm worried that in Colombia that the combination of the right wing attacks from labor also with the legitimate problems that the left side of labor is having with access to the Ministry of Labor and the daily activities of the right. I am worried about the combination. I've seen, we think we've saw it it's the same old thing, what we saw in Chile, what we saw in Haiti, and what we're having to guard against now. And that's why it's so important. I think, for instance, this Red Sipasa tour, and we're trying to get a resolutions of solidarity with them. It's so important that we show solidarity with these left unions that are standing for peace and putting their lives on the line for peace. Uh, I want to say that in Colombia, and in Peru, in Peru, uh, they definitely talked with me about this issue. There is a push that they say comes great, largely from U.S. functionaries on the ground, pushing the established more left unions to turn away from like the WFTU 
and to get involved with the U.S. supported international activities. They say that this is like an active conversation that comes up again and again. At the same time, they say that these same entities are pushing for the formation of new unions and new confederations that break with the old established confederations and create more dependency on, on the U.S., a more independent and even pro-corporate line. And for instance, the unions that are striking against the Department of Labor in, in, in Colombia are unions that are part of one of these new confederations. So this is a new tactic that we're seeing come down the line. I want to just mention one other thing because I don't want to, I want to give time to you, Frank. But you can't talk about uh, Peru and Colombia without talking about other countries. They're very, very important regionally. In particular, you can't talk about Colombia without talking about Venezuela because it's the same office. The Bogota office is the office for Venezuela. And a lot of the funding that goes to Colombia is both for Colombia and Venezuela. I just real quickly, if you go to the NED.org site today, I wanted to give you some facts and figures, but I want to hurry through this and I'm going to write it up. So stay tuned for what I write up because the facts and figures are pretty telling themselves. But you try to do research, you go to the NED.org site today, the information up there is two years behind because I follow this pretty regularly. It hasn't been changed since like 19, February 22. So it's for 19 or for 2021. They usually do this every February. It hasn't been done in, um, in a couple of years. You go and you try to go to the archive of past uh, grants and it has been long time, months, maybe years that it's said this is under construction. Now it doesn't even say that. You click on it, it takes you to the home page. They don't want you to know what's up. And when it comes to Venezuela and Nicaragua especially, they really don't want you to go up, know what's up. Again, I'm not going to go into the um, facts and figures, but first of all, a lot of the money that they give for operations in these countries, they give to themselves like the NED gives to the IRI, the International Republican Institute, or to the Solidarity Center, which are core institutes. And it's just, and what they do with it, you tell me, I don't know. They don't talk about what they've uh, paid towards uh, Venezuela or done in Venezuela since like 2014. But I know good and well, like last year, they gave $975,000 to the solid, I'm talking about the Solidarity Center doesn't talk about what they've been doing since 2014. Well, I know good and well that last year or 2021, they gave $975,000 for operations in Colombia and um, Venezuela. And they did that the year before that. And the year before that, they gave something. But they don't say anything about what they're doing in, in Venezuela. You only know that by occasionally seeing some of their old partners standing next to like Juan Guaido or something like that. So I'm just saying that Oh, but you look at, at Colombia, you look at Haiti, you look at any other country, and they at least will give you some names of some groups, some organizations they're giving money to. They might be hired to find some information on, but you can do a little research. Every bit of the money that goes to Nicaragua or Venezuela, it doesn't attribute it to anybody. It gives some vague title unless it attributes it to like the International Republican Institute or the Solidarity Center, core institutes of the NED, which is like saying, oh, we gave it to ourselves, but there is no information. Now, as far as the elections in uh, Venezuela, you know, I'm not here to say, you know, make the point of whether they were uh, legitimate or not uh, to get into that argument. But what I am here to say is that the interference is ongoing, constant within and without the, those borders. And how could you even, how can a country function without constant distortion under these three kinds of circumstances? And what I'm saying is the NED by itself provides something like, I forget, in one year, 
I believe it was something five or six million dollars of who knows what funding for operations in Venezuela. And some of that goes to the Solidarity Center, and some of it goes through uh, the, the office there in Bogota. So what happens in Bogota and what happens in, in Peru happens throughout Latin America. Those are funnel countries to uh, operations. I just talked about Venezuela, but it's true for other countries. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So Frank is going to be talking about uh, workers in Colombia who were um, uh, disabled in a GM plant and who has been fighting for 11 years to try to get some sort of restitution um, and because they have been disabled and haven't been able to work. So, and after that, we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to be, I want to express my gratitude to everybody who's on, on this uh, Zoom call. Um, and I'm grateful for your interest. Um, I am a retired UAW, former president and chairman of UAW Local 909. I served on the UAW GM international staff and the umpire staff uh, before I retired in uh, the end of 2006. I have been active on the international front for as long as I've been a UAW member and before. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is really my latest iteration of that activism uh, involving GM workers in Colombia, who I first learned about, about their struggle in uh, 2012, uh, when one of them, Jorge Pada, who was the leader of this uh, workers' insurgency in, in Bogota, uh, appeared and came to a labor notes conference. And um, I heard his story, I learned his story, and have been involved uh, since. Uh, it's a remarkable story. I do want to, uh, I, I do want to uh, preface, um, um, and I'll come back to this later on, but I want to preface by with a story that came out of Colombia, which I thought was truly remarkable. And that was the um, legal case brought by banana workers against Chiquita Bananas, a case that has taken 17 years. And in the Florida courtroom, a jury found against Chiquita Bananas, Chiquita Brands or whatever, uh, for the murder of uh, workers in their, in, their, in their employ, banana workers. And the jury awarded the workers $38 million. And these were just eight workers. There's hundreds and hundreds more cases that are going to be brought against uh, the Chiquita Bananas. And I think that it's an incredible story, and it deals with the whole question of death squads, which I'd like to come back to later on. But let me, uh, let me start by, I, what I did is um, I've gone back to 2012 and I wanna talk about, I wanna, there's, there's three documents that I'm actually gonna share with you, which I think are very, very important in terms of context. One is a document from the AFL-CIO, one is from the U.S. Department of Labor, and one is from the Washington Office on Latin America. The AFL CIO issued a statement in, 12, in 2012, and I'm going to give you a, a share it with you to give you a sense of what that was. The AFL CIO calls for the immediate action around the mistreatment of the members of a social, an association of ex-workers and injured workers at Comotores at General Motors US, uh, GM plant on the outskirts of Bogota. According to a surgical workers, this is in the statement by the FFL, they have been fired illegally and their medical records have been handled illegally. GM Comatoris management and the Colombian Ministry of Labor have also denied them workers' compensation and access to early retirement or other benefits after being injured in the workplace. 
when GM comatories would not agree for over a year to engage with labor ministry med med mediation, the workers began a hunger strike in front of the U.S. Embassy in Bogota in August 1st of 2012. And I just want a slight correction there. We're into the 14th year of this struggle. So I'm sorry. Yeah, 12th year. The U.S. and Colombian governments must bring GM, this is a quote from Trumpka, the U.S. and Colombian governments must bring GM comatories into dialogue with the Sochico to help facilitate a swift and fair response to the workers' grievances. Furthermore, the Colombian Ministry of Labor must thoroughly examine General Motors' occupational health and safety practices and the use of a collective pact, that's another word, set of words for company union, in Colombia for compliance with national law and the labor provisions of the Colombian Free Trade Agreement. And further, rather than engage in meaningful discussion about its past actions and address the workers' documentation of violations directly, GM re representatives walked away from the process when it became clear that the process could lead, could lead the Colombian Ministry of Labor to acknowledge past errors and encourage a negotiated solution. Trumpka continued. Then then there, in their mistreatment of a surgical and their use of a collective pact, Comatorius has chosen, GM Comatorius has chosen to operate in a way that places in doubt their commitment to comply with national laws in addition to international standards. This indifference to the rights of workers also sends a clear message about compliance to other employers in Colombia, a country in which these rights are regularly violated. Trumpka concluded. Now, U.S. Department of Labor, which a few days later issued its own news release. The U.S. Department of Labor congratulates General Motors Comodores and the Association of Injured Workers and Ex-Workers of General Motors Colombia, which is comprised of current and former workers for reaching an agreement to participate in mediation facilitated by the U.S. Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. The workers of a such call also have ended their hunger strike, which incidentally was in its 20, 20, 22nd day. The U.S. Embassy Bogota and the U.S. Department of Labor have been following the GM Comatories and such call case closely and actively engaged with both parties and other stakeholders to come to a resolution. The Labor Department will continue to monitor developments closely, but welcome the stated good faith commitment to dialogue and mediation by both parties as a way forward in peacefully resolving their differences. Twelve members of a surgical have been protesting in front of the U.S. Embassy in Bogota since August of 2011, alleging wrongdoings by GM Comatories. On August 1st, 2012, the group began a hunger strike. This week, representatives from GM headquarters and the United Auto Workers traveled to Colombia to help broker a path towards forward between the two groups. So that was the U.S. Department of Labor. And now we have a statement from uh, WOLA. And for those of you who may not be familiar, it's the Washington Office on Latin America. It was founded in 1974 in the wake of the Chilean coup. Chilean coup by church leaders, including the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and National Council of Churches. The Wola's mission is to connect policymakers in Washington to those with firsthand knowledge of the thousands of deaths, disappearances, cases of torture, and unjust imprisonment occurring under the dictatorships of that era. And they issued a statement. The headline was, GM walks out of talks with hunger strikers in Colombia. On August 6, thanks to political pressure from the U.S. Congress and civil society groups and a subsequent intervention by the Ambassador McKinley, representatives of the Colombian Ministry of Labor, International Labor Organization, ILO, and GM Colombia met with the workers as the workers presented their concerns. 
which were supported by the Inspector General's investigations, GM representatives walked out of the meeting without resolving any of the workers' concerns. The U.S. and Colombia have committed themselves to improving the labor rights situation confronting Colombia's workers by reducing trade union violence and impunity for aggression against labor leaders while also improving labor standards and working conditions. It is, it is unacceptable that a subsidiary of a U.S. company behave so cruelly towards sick workers whose lives have been devastated due to injuries acquired on the job. If the U.S. and Colombia are un unable to adequately resolve the situation in favor of a small group of workers, what does this say about Obama and Santos administration's ability to guarantee the commitments made to the workers of Colombia once the U.S.-Colombia free trade agreement is fully put into place? We are now here in 2024. The workers have occupied their tent and camp in front of the U.S. Embassy 24-7, ever since. Not only did GM walk out, the AFL shut up, and the UAW turned its back. And the common theme that the UAW and GM, their narrative once they returned to the U.S., was that the workers were asking for too much. Not only did the UAW turn its back on these workers, not only did the AFL-CIO go silent, the UAW actually urged other unions to do the same. Yeah, you know, the unions that wanted to come forward, like the U.S. steel workers or like Unifor. Never mind, of course, that in this time period, it was the same UAW leadership that was under a bankruptcy uh, or a corruption scandal, which saw, you know, 12 or 14 officers go to jail, including two presidents who presided over the UAW during this period. And the GM, the UAW GM vice president, Joey Ashton, who sat on the board of General Motors uh, shortly after this episode, when the uh, mediation failed and they and they left the country, and I can say that while the Solidarity Center in Bogota appeared helpful in the very beginning, they abandoned the GM workers as well. And uh, I was actually uh, going back in all the documentation, and I have a communication from the director of the Solidarity Center in Bogota, who's of course, and, and for Colombia, and also for Venezuela, Red Dumit, who said that the Solidarity, I'm, I'm quoting, the Solidarity Center is helping Jorge Pada, the president of Asotico, prepare a formal request regarding the status of the case in question. This request warns of the potential for legal actions resulting in disciplinary sanctions against inspectors that have evaded their legal responsibilities. Um, we believe that political pressure uh, directed to the U.S. Embassy and congressional representatives should be applied seeking completion of the case and guarantees of due process procedures um, and so on. So, this was in 2012. The Solidarity Center uh, similarly has abandoned the struggle and has not spoken about it for years and ceased meeting with the uh, uh, injured and fired workers uh, in Colombia, even though their intent in camp ensues to this current day. What has sustained it has been a grassroots movement that emerged in solidarity with the injured and fired GM workers, principally among rank and file UAW represented auto workers, but encompassing a broad community of support from Columbia solidarity groups, including James Group, uh, the Alliance for Global Justice. Uh, it certainly also includes the organization that I helped to found with Carol and Kim and Steve and uh, so on, the Lepayo, 
Um, also, the La Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, labor unions from as far away as Great Britain and Brazil, uh, government representatives, inc including the likes of Minnesota, the Attorney General Keith Ellison, and solidarity statements from notables, including Danny Glover, Noam Chomsky, Bishop Thomas Gumbleton, etc. And the list could go on. The key to the rank and file movement in the UAW has been the auto workers caravan. And more recently, the Unite All Workers for Democracy, the UAWD reform a caucus in the UAW, which was instrumental in winning the right election of international officers and electing a reform slate headed by UAW President Sean Fain and uh, UAW Vice President over GM, Mike Booth. This new leadership, has taken up the fight to complete what was abandoned 12 years ago in urging General Motors to return to the mediation table and to reach a just uh, solution, resolution to the workers uh, who have so valiantly persisted in their struggle. Now, uh, in April uh, of this year, the plant closed. GM closed it abruptly without warning the workers. And GM um, met, had meetings with the remaining workers. I think there were a total of about uh, 800. And they held these private meetings with the workers saying you either accept a voluntary buyout or you're going to be laid off and you won't have nothing. And 400 of the workers succumbed. 400 of the workers are still holding out. The labor ministry has been forced to call out GM for its uh, illegal behavior in regards to the shutdown. And we don't know whether they intend to reopen the plant down the line with a new workforce. Uh, they have an agreement with uh, 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 one of the other companies from Japan to continue operations to 2029. So it's a very confusing picture. But to the UAW's credit, they're not only taking up the case of the injured workers, but they're also taking up the case of the workers who have been discharged, who are currently, some of them, a small fraction of them, being represented by their unions in Trame. Um, so that gives you that gives you an up-to-date uh, where we are now. I do want to go back to this example that I gave about uh, Chiquita Bananas. And the reason I'm doing that is because we as uh, anti-imperialist activists realize and understand that the U.S. maintains its imperial domination, not only through the trade union movement, but also through an operation that we call the School of the Americans or School of the Americas or the School of Assassins that was extremely active in Colombia and helped to train paramilitaries and the police, etc., and were responsible for the assassination of 3,000 workers in a 20-year period in Colombia that delayed the passing of the free trade agreement for years because of the ghastly behavior of the Colombian uh, dictatorship or government in, with, with the aid of the U.S. And the reason I mention that is because in running across some of my documents, one of the documents that ran across is that we, those of us, and there were UAW involvement in the effort to close the School of the Americas, we had none other than Linda Chavez Thompson, who was the Secretary Treasurer at that time, in 2009, I believe, no, 2006, that came to the, it was unusual for the FFL to CIO to show up at the Labor Caucus that we had at Fort Benning for the closure of the SOA, and, you know, this was the AFL-CIO. Let's be clear what the School of the Americas is all about, she said. Is it a college for professional murderers and sadists? It is. But it's here for a reason. The reason the School of the Americas was built in the first place, and the reason it's open today, is to train the militaries in Latin America to prop those up in power. The multinational corporations, the rich elites, the owners of the mines and plantations and factories. And I bring this up 
because, of course, the AFL-CIO Solidarity Center have never at all talked about we need to build a movement that closes down the School of the Americas, even though she obviously recognized their role. And it shows uh, the duplicity uh, uh, in, in the role of AFL that they're mum about this repressive apparatus that was responsible, as far as I know, of killing, uh, helping kill Colombians uh, through 2019. It's not, it's a, it's a going affair. So I put that as a contextual situation. Um, nobody in a GM comatose has been assassinated, but frequently over time, there were uh, various threats. So it was close if it didn't, it didn't happen to them directly. With that, I'll conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So I, just before I open it up, I just want to say that James' um, description of soft imperialism and, and the fear, imperialism with the fist is sort of represented in the Solidarity Center because they try to pretend as if somehow or other they're helping campesinos and and workers in Latin America, when in fact they still represent the American government, which is really the the fist behind them and why they get so much money. And you know the the what what Lapayo tries to do is expose these these labor fakers that you know argue in the way that um you know frank said you know these uaw people wanted to have a deal for the the disabled workers when in fact they completely abandoned them because they're completely in the pocket of american imperialism the democratic party they have no sense of independence whatsoever they are fat cats themselves and you know we think that we have to build an independent working class movement that's going to challenge the sellout you know posture of the AFL CIO and and we also Steve and I belong to an organization called the United Front Committee for a Labor Party which wants to build a workers party that's going to be independent of the Democratic Party and wants to expose them for being um you know imperialists in the same way as the you know the rest of the american ruling classes and start building a, an international working class movement that will challenge you know american imperialism and capitalism in general okay so for anybody who'd like to speak please let me know just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. There were several references. By the way, excellent talks by all three of, of you folks. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, there's been several mentions of the NED, and it really hasn't been explained. So let me take a minute to explain this stuff. Um, I will say that uh, I've been studying the AFL-CIO's foreign policy for over 40 years. Um, I have a, a book some of you might have read. It's called... Uh, AFL-CIO Secret War of, uh, Against Developing Country Workers, Solidarity Sabotage. And now Jeff, he was pretty modest, but his new book is called Blue Collar Empire. I'll put it up there and hold it up there. Jeff, you did one of these quick things. Uh, you got to give yourself a little more credit, brother. Uh, so I want to speak, speak on the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, now, this is one of the most cynical operations um, that I've seen, and I've seen a lot of cynicism in my life, but this is this is a masterful one. What they're doing is they're hiding the fact. For let me explain sort of politically what's going on, and then I'll, I'll talk some details on this. But basically, the idea is that the National Endowment for Democracy. I mean, God, who can be against democracy? Actually, recognizes two different types of democracy. Now, one is the popular democracy that we're taught about in school. The one person, one vote. If it's going to affect you, you have a say, things like that. Now, that's called, that, at least among academics, is called popular democracy from the, from the grassroots up. That's not what they're talking about. There is a second kind of democracy, which the scholars call polyarchal, or you can call it top-down or constrained democracy. Now, what so what the NED, what the National Endowment for Democracy is doing is is going around the world 
projecting this top down, this constrained democracy as though it's the bottom up type. It is totally opposite. And basically what it means is that those in power get to make the decisions, whether it's around elections or, or uh, programs and things like that. They, they make the decisions, sort of set the parameters, and then they allow ordinary people to vote within the, within the constraints they impose. It is not the same as popular democracy. And that's why I say it's so incredibly cynical, because it, it projects it as though it's popular democracy, when in reality it's not. So you have to understand, anytime you hear it in NED, they're doing this. Now, this was established in 1983 under that known Democrat, Ronald Reagan. Okay, uh, It was designed to change... Uh, um, the the U.S. foreign policy. So the U.S., for example, I'm gonna uh, I would argue has 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 since 1945 in particular. You can go back and argue much longer, but at least since 45 has tried to dominate the countries of the world. Now, um, ideally, they would like to do it without having to send the Marines in. It's very messy. People notice things like that. So they ha they've had a foreign policy, and this is what Afield was doing, is that basically they were going into countries and responding to uh, upsurges against the established people. That didn't work. And eventually, and particularly because of the work that a number of us did uh, within the labor movement, we forced John Sweeney to end those type of operations. In the meantime, though, the NED had come up with what they're doing now is they're flooding these countries that they want to control, which is everything in Latin America, needless to say. Uh, and they're doing it uh, by going in and trying to support groups that on the ground, so indigenous groups on the ground that will support their policies. So they're not reacting to uh, crises. They're going in and organizing on the on the ground to find groups that will push U.S. foreign policy uh, in advance from within the country. And they've done this particularly, uh, we really saw this, we've really seen this in, in Venezuela, for example, and, and James is really, I like how you tied in Haiti with this, this uh, uh, and, and of course, Colombia and Peru. But this is the way they're operating. Now, to understand this, the NED has four main institutes. They have the national the National Democratic Institute, which is the international arm of the Democratic Party. They have the International Republican Institute, which is the international wing of the Republican Party. They have the international wing of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is Labor's arch enemy inside the U.S. And they also have the Solidarity Center. Now, the Solidarity Center, uh, which they don't really define, but what it is basically is that is the U.S., uh, the AFL-CIO's foreign policy uh, operation. It's, it's literally uh, their, their headquarters on the international affairs is on the eighth floor of the AFL-CIO, and it directly controls the Solidarity Center. Okay, Um now, so what they do is they have these four institutes, the, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Chamber of Commerce, and the labor movement, their international operations, they get together, and their, their goal is to protect the U.S. operations around the world, and what I would call the U.S. empire. And not everybody uses that term, but I think it's an accurate term. It's not, it's, it's different, it differs from the Roman empire, because uh, we're not taking over territory, but we are gaining economic and political control, which is cheaper and more more uh, uh, opaque than, say, going in and sending the Marines. So they're operating in this, and they're operating wherever they can. They've operated most clearly in, uh, uh, in Latin America, and they're doing this stuff. And so what we have to understand is, is what these groups say. They come together, they say, this is our po policy, and then they have other groups apply for money and they give this money. Now in the case of the Solidarity Center, so this is the this is the international wing of the AFL CIO, the Solidarity Center gets over 90% of its of its uh, income from 
the U.S. government, mainly from the National Endowment for Democracy. They also get some from the uh, uh, AID, the American uh, Institute for Development, et cetera, et cetera. Over 90%, which James alluded to, comes. It does not come from the AFL-CIO. They give a minuscule amount of money. And in over a hundred years of for U.S. foreign policy, of, of AFL-CIO foreign policy, excuse me, AFL-CIO foreign policy, they have never, ever given an honest report about what they're doing around the world to members of the AFL-CIO. In fact, this is, this is confined to such a small group that most of the labor leadership in the AFL-CIO does not know what they do. Now, you can go to their website, and it's it's a lovely website. They're, they're telling you all the wonderful things they're doing, blah, blah, blah. But what you have to understand is they're not saying anything what they're doing. We know they're in eight, 60, over 62 countries around the world. We don't know why they're in these countries. We don't know who they're working with. We don't know what they're doing. And even when the the California AFL-CIO, which was one-sixth of the entire organization, condemned their AFL-CIO foreign policy in 2005 at the National Convention, they changed that and, and turned that resolution into a, a, a one that, that praised the AFL-CIO's foreign policy. So what you have to understand, this is not being done from outside the labor movement. This is within the labor movement, which means that if we get our act together, there's a chance to change this. And so what we're trying to do with LaPio is let the, get, make this information available, show that it's now documented. And, and Jeff's book, The Blue Collar Empire, or I guess it's just Blue Collar Empire, excuse me, Jeff, uh, is going to be on sale later this month. And he's done an excellent job in detailing particularly the work in Latin America. Okay. We know this stuff. It's not We're not speculating. This is stuff you can take to the bank. And we demand that the AFL-CIO completely eradicate these foreign operations. They don't go in these countries to help workers, although maybe here and there it might help in a particular struggle. But they're going there to help ensure that the U.S. dominates those countries. It is no good. It is evil. And uh, I just wanted to try to illuminate this in more detail. So I hope I didn't go on too long, but but I wanted to bring this on. It's it's something, there's a lot of confusion around this stuff and they do it purposely because they don't want us to get on their tail. But we're on it and we're going to stay on it and shame on these bastards. And, and by the way, uh, when this uh, session is over, it's, it's being recorded as everybody knows, uh, I hope everybody will get in touch with us to get copies of it. And please send it out to your friends and networks, particularly in the labor movement, and ask them to send out to their friends and, and networks. The only way we're going to get the stuff out there is if we get it out because it ain't going to be covered. It ain't going to be covered on, on mainstream media and not, not even on MSNBC or anything like that. So this needs to go out, and it's it's very important. And I thank everybody for your attention, and I thank thank the speakers for for excellent excellent presentations. Thank you all. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Is there anybody else who'd like to share or intervene? I I know that there are people on here yeah. who have disagreements. Um, and it would be helpful if those people would say something. Uh, Steve, if you'd like to. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the issues with the labor movement in this country, uh, with the purges that took place in the 50s and the formation of the AFL-CIO is basically virtually the entire trade union leadership are pro-capitalist. They say that they support capitalism. They want a bigger piece of the pie, but they support capitalism. They openly say that. And secondly, they support U.S. imperialism openly. In fact, they can't say the word genocide about what's going on in Gaza at this point, even though it's it's pretty obvious that that's what it is. And one of the things that we have to do in relationship to this is, first of all, this operation is, a, is an appendage of the U.S. government. What we've seen in the presentations here is that workers unions have no say in what's going on. Joining the Solidarity Center is like joining the government. 
It's a government operation. It has nothing to do with the AFL-CIO and any kind of rank and file control. Now, there are the one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that the uh, Solidarity Center is union. And we met some of them at Labor Notes. And they argued that they're doing good things, like in Thailand. Uh, they're helping women and they're 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 helping the people and and you know they're doing good things. Now that's like kind of green imperialism, green cover for for labor imperialism, because that's what we're talking about. The other aspect that I want to say is that while the AFL CIO is uh international operations or a government appendage, the same AFL CIO leadership don't say anything about militarization of war. I mean, there are trillions of dollars from the United States going to the war machine, uh, to U 800 U.S. bases around the world, and for oppression of workers, for bombing of workers, um, and to set up supporting military dictatorships, which we help create. And I think that is connected with the, the fact that basically the AFL-CIO uh, international policy is appendage, but uh, I think it's connected to the fact that the AFL-CIO has never talked about it. But the amount of money that they're getting from the U.S. government for their "quote unquote" solidarity center is a significantly large portion of the portion of the AFL-CIO's budget. And in other words, the staff of the uh, of the solidarity center is uh, nearly as large as the entire AFL-CIO staff. So how could it be that the the staffing of the AFL-CIO, a large part of the staff, are actually government funded agents internationally? That's another question that has to be raised. All these issues are, not only are they not known by most workers in the United States, but when we brought it up in the CWA, uh, they said we can't talk about, for example, the Histadrut and our relationship and what we're doing because you know this is something that's uh, it's not to be discussed. So I think we have to break that information blockade. That's why we set up Lapayo. And I think that that's part of the process of educating workers. And I think there's hope because what's going on in the UAW is significant. The fact that there's working to support the workers, the GM workers in Colombia. Um, and I think when workers see the relationship, and that's one of the things we want to do, is build direct relationships with Chilean workers and other workers around the world on the record of the afl cio in their countries and also direct links so we can link up workers in the United States directly with workers internationally. That's it. Thank you. Elizabeth? Hey, thank you very much. I am a retired person now, and I'm from Canada. And I know for this has to be a reality that this is I, everything you say is true. I knew I found that out when I was part of Amnesty International in the '60s. The churches were the ones that said about the workers. It was, you know, these things have been known. All this has been known for decades, and then all of a sudden, there was so much prosperity. I guess for some that it was sort of buried. And then we've got this decline in Canada that everything we got in the 60s is gone. And we do not have unions are just fighting to keep their head above water, but they have never ever, I know unions that were fighting for workers in Chile and in Colombia and Guatemala. I mean, I know all of South America and I applaud your actions now, because at the time, people didn't really think that we we would be at risk. Well, we are at risk now of going down the same as getting minimum wage and not having money. And the fact that GM went up hauling the organizations, the corporations that have done what they've done. And people say, well, they've but it, they were so good here, but they're not good anymore here. They're just beggars and like being in a welfare line, just go to the government. The government just gave good year millions because they have to retrofit their plant to be more green. Well, isn't that nice? That's a real birthday present for them. And so that when the workers here, they will open their eyes and I'm sure the states, I'm sure it's globally, because I see this, we can't fight the machine because the labor union is the biggest working group that has a power built within its system and it needs to wake up and I really it breaks my heart what's going on around the world but I can say that what you are doing is absolutely imperative to wake the people up to say they've been shafted it just they can still go to the store and have a house and that's about it they can't live like a 
ordinary human being. They can't help like they want to. And so that's just my that's just my simple take. Thank you. Anybody else? Frank? <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to say that I, I think that Jeff uh, publishing um, Blue Collar Empire uh, is um, really uh, incredibly timely. And I'm curious now that you've been talking about the book and making presentations and it's going to be out on the shelves on September 24th, what kind of responses and reactions you've been getting uh, and particularly whether you're getting any pushback from the labor bureaucracy itself. Thanks. Um, the So far, it's only been positive reactions. I haven't, you know, I think if to the extent that the, you know, labor bureaucracy, labor officialdom is, is going to be unhappy about the book, they're mostly just going to try to ignore it um, and ignore me, which I think is probably what they've done to other writers and researchers and activists in, in the past. Um, but so far, you know, it's mostly been people from, you know, what we would call the labor left, you know, the more left wing progressive uh, elements in the labor movement. Um, and they've been very enthusiastic about the book, um, people who have had a chance to read it, um, especially, but even people who haven't read it, but they just, you know, they know about the, the topic, the subject matter, they're excited to take a look at it. There's a lot of obviously, you know, younger, younger people who have been helping to kind of rejuve, bring new energy into the labor movement, who maybe are not as familiar with this history, uh, and they're hearing about the book. It seems like, and they're going to read it. So, and the reason why I wrote it, you know, is to just add to this this whole conversation and to try to uh, start a or restart, you know, or, or continue a, a discussion in labor circles about this really ugly history, which is continuing into the present of uh, the AFL-CIO in particular being a instrument, a willing instrument and partner of U.S. empire. Um, so hopefully, yeah, the book will, a lot of people will read it and talk about it and it'll, it'll uh, kindle more discussion, more activity more research, more writing, because, you know, obviously I don't cover everything in the book and I don't even get into the things that are happening in the present day with the Solidarity Center, except very briefly in the conclusion. So, uh, yeah, hopefully there'll be a lot more. But yeah, nothing so far, no pushback. But I, I don't really expect much other than just being ignored by by uh, the top officials in the labor movement. I'd like to say that this is an opportune time for your book. And, you know, American capitalism is clearly on the decline and American workers are suffering in the same way as Elizabeth was talking about in Canada. And I think one of the demands that we have to make is open the books to see how the AFL has gotten money and how it historically spends the money on organizing coups all over the world. Um, even Sean Fain, who is the more radical of the union leaders, on one hand calls for a ceasefire, but on the other hand has on his on the sweatshirt a bomber, like we build bombs. And those bombs are going to kill people in Gaza. And so at the best, the American labor movement is really schizophrenic. At the worst, it's, you know, pro-imperialist. But the best of it is Sean Fain. And he just doesn't get that he's this this bomber on his on his sweatshirt is in support of American imperialism. We have to demand that he break from the Democratic Party. He's supporting Harris, another Incre she's she's incredible. We should have a discussion about, you know, the Democratic Party. But um, the last thing that I want to say, because uh, I don't want to I want other people to participate, is that I'm on the International Committee of the Professional Staff Congress, which is a local within inside the AFT. And there's a debate going on about Maduro. And there are people who are posting how horrible Maduro is, how he stole the election, 
um, how undemocratic he is. And then there are people who are just, you know, like soaking him up, right? Living in his, in his shadow. Um, and for me, um, and I'm assuming that there are other people who, you know, who are in um, Lapayo who don't necessarily support Maduro. Uh, Maduro's far from being a socialist or a communist and could be undemocratic. But on the other hand, it's not up to people to call for the American government to participate in overthrowing Maduro. And I think, unfortunately, some of the people in the left and people in the international committee of my union are essentially calling for getting rid of Maduro. And the only way to get rid of Maduro would be for the American imperialism to intervene. And I think that is something with, that is really a very bad thing, that American imperialism <laughs> is not out to defend democracies internationally, that this is up to the, the Venezuelan people to make that decision. We have to call for hands off of Maduro, hands off of Venezuela. And basically, you know, we can say what we think, but this is not something that we should be calling on the American government to participate in. Um, okay, Ricardo. Yeah. I just want to uh, actually follow up upon that uh, point that, you know, Carol is raising. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the U.S. is on a, in, in a decline economically. And, uh, you know, uh, its uh, power is being shown, uh, you know, mostly uh, military and, uh, you know, still has a big uh, diplomatic uh, a capacity to, uh, you know, uh, push p uh, countries uh, of the third world, etc. But, uh, you know, economically, is uh, losing ground internationally. I mean, and uh, particularly in Latin America. You know, in Latin America, if you look at, uh, you know, the economic facts, there are countries that the U.S. Uh, is being uh, displaced as, the, as a major economic uh, power uh, partner and uh, investor, such as, uh, you know, if you can look at the Argentina's uh, government webpage, you see what I'm talking about. And, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. is trying to assert uh, its dominion and trying to not lose ground versus uh, China and the EU in, in Latin America, particularly. And in some uh, instances, as for example, uh, uh, the U.S. directly is dealing with uh, the labor movement. But, you know, in Argentina, for example, uh, in July this year, the CGT, which is the largest uh, confederation of labor uh, in Argentina, the leaders visited the American embassy twice and met with uh, Mark Stanley, the ambassador. And, uh, you know, in uh, July the 18th, the Argentinian labor bureaucrats uh, met with uh, not only the ambassador, but also with a representation from the U.S. Congress uh, uh, led by uh, Benjamin Cardin and uh, 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 Steve Cohen, Daniel Goldman, uh, Brad Schneider, Debbie, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and uh, 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 Congressman Hoyer. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it shows the desperation that the United States has to assert its dominion. And that is the nature of uh, imperialism. I mean, imperialism is a system of uh, uh, competition among imperialist powers and uh, a control of the so-called colonial and uh, semi-colonial countries. It was uh, that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and still it is today. And uh, you know, in 1945, uh, the United States was in a different situation than it was in 1933, as for example. The U.S. Uh, before the Second World War still was not the hegemonic power in uh, in the world. It was uh, Britain and the U.S. were surging and competing 
Actually, you know, uh, this is in a response to uh, Mr. Kim Sipes. Actually, the United States invaded Haiti and the Dominican Republic in order to oust Germans' influence. You know, I studied uh, history in the Dominican Republic in the summer of 2007. You can ask historians over there. And, uh, you know, the invasion of uh, Mexico uh, in 1917 and, uh, you know, Nicaragua in 1934, even intervening in the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, in, I mean, in the Civil War later after, you know, 17, and uh, even in the Boxer Rebellion, the, the U.S. was competing and aspiring to be one of the hegemonic imperialist powers. In, say, after, in the Second World War, after the Second World War, they did acquire that capacity because the other imperialist uh, powers were weakened. And the U.S. was the only power that uh, had the capacity to uh, intervene military everywhere, organize uh, a domestic trade union movement that could help American imperialism abroad. It's a, you know, it's a basic characteristic of the liberal bureaucracy of the imperialist countries to support their colonial and neo-colonial country. And they were able to do that in 1945 with the emerging of the, the U.S. as a, the, on the undisputed principal imperialist power. And we got to have that very clear. And now they are in a decline. And uh, that's why they are stepping their efforts, you know, uh, to control and uh, uh, assert dominion. I mean, look at the United States in 1954. And, uh, you know, they were able to intervene everywhere. They outcast, they uh, dethroned, uh, uh, overthrew the government of uh, Salval, uh, Jacobo Arbenz in, in Guatemala. Right now, they are having a hard time to uh, get Maduro out of power. You know, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the intervention in Afghanistan was a complete disaster. In Iraq, they didn't achieve, you know, their goals. <laughs> they tried to control the oil. Most of the oil export, uh, exports of Iraq are going to the EU. And uh, this <laughs> led imperialist intervention in, 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 in the Ukraine is leading nowhere. And uh, this was instigated by the United States. You know, the United States is losing ground as a, you know, imperialist power. And, uh, you know, the labor bureaucrats that buy bonds from the uh, Israeli government that uh, collaborate in uh, projects of construction of, in American bases and all that uh, uh, domestically and abroad, they do collaborate with American imperialism. And the only way we're gonna stop that is getting rid of capitalism and the US imperialism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was good. Um, I think uh, there are two issues that need to be raised in relationship to Latin America, and that is, among others, and that is um, Venezuela, what's happening in Venezuela, because the uh, uh, National Endowment for Democracy and the Solidarity Center are getting millions of dollars to work with Venezuelan migrants, people who have been forced out of Venezuela partly as a result and largely as a result of the uh, economic blockade of Venezuela. And in Argentina and other countries, these uh, Venezuelan uh, refugees are being recruited uh, through nonprofits. And that's another issue that we need to address. The use of nonprofits by uh, the Solidarity Center to basically carry out a political agenda and they're being organized and funneled into right-wing support, right-wing efforts to overthrow the Maduro government. That's what's happening with these nonprofits that the AFL-CIO is setting up with the support of the U.S. government. And I think that needs to be uh, something that we need to address. Why are we doing that? Why is the AFL-CIO involved in setting up nonprofits of organizations which really are aimed towards overthrowing the government of Venezuela? The second issue and Rob McKenzie is not on, who wrote about the Ford uh, invasion, an invasion by the CIA and the AFL-CIA of the Ford plant, is that as a result of the United States uh, trade war with China and fight to uh, 
challenge the Chinese investments and in imperial interests. Uh, a large amount of, of uh, you know, export capital is going into Mexico at this point. And that, that money that's going into Mexico is building massive industrial uh, infrastructure in Mexico. Uh, Tesla's got a plant, but there are a large number of plants in Mexico. Now, one of the things that hasn't been reported on, and we were have discussed it in La Pio, is that the the the, the AFL CIO, the State Department, uh, and uh, AID are spending three hundred million dollars uh, in Mexico uh, to remold, in my view, remold the Mexican labor movement. They're setting up labor colleges. Uh, they're funding unions in Mexico, uh, in what they call independent unions, and also. Um, they're uh, intervening in, in the labor movement in Mexico. And I think their agenda is to set up American-style corporate unions in Mexico. And in relationship to NAFTA, uh, the U.S. multinationals, I mean, U.S. export of capital and control of a large part of the Mexican economy um, through privatization, uh, in part under the NAFTA agreement, has led to a situation where these workers are basically working for U.S. multinationals. And the question of self-determination for the Mexicans, the right of the Mexican workers to control their own country uh, and to run their own industries is an issue which has to be addressed. And I think that what is going on now is a, an organized effort through this $300 million, which the AFL-CIO is not talking about. Uh, I mean, the NLRB is being uh, shortchanged while money is going to supposedly the labor movement in Mexico to help the, the Mexican labor movement. That's how they put it. But the reality is, I think this infusion of this large amount of money, we're talking a large amount of money, 300 million, is really to protect U.S. capitalist investment in Mexico and to make sure that the Mexican unions don't challenge U.S. imperial interests in Mexico. And, and that's something that I think is important to look at in relationship to what's happening in Mexico. I just, uh, and I don't want to, abuse people's time. I know that this has gone on for a while, uh, but I just want to make sure to kind of correct the record about uh, Sean Fain. Um, I want to clarify that uh, Sean Fain has actually played a, a, a leadership role in regards to uh, labor opposition to the genocide in Gaza, uh, not only coming out early in December of last year, uh, with the likes of uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, uh, Bush, you know, con uh, Congress, Congressional Representative Bush, Cory Bush, and others uh, calling for the ceasefire, and then on the and then uh, on the occasion of the appearance of uh, uh, Netanyahu at the U.S. Congress, Sean Fain was led uh, one of the seven unions that denounced his appearance and called for the ending of shipments of weapons uh, to Israel. Uh, and I want to point out that he did that in spite of the fact that we have a federal monitor in, uh, in uh, you know, investigating the UAW. It'll be going on for a total of six years. And the monitor tried to attack uh, the UAW ceasefire position and has been now harassing the UAW. On that basis, even though their role of the monitor is strictly to maintain uh, financial integrity of the UAW, which the UAW has been doing. So I just want to clear the record on Sean Fain. I think that um, considering where uh, our labor movement has been, per the descriptions of uh, Jeff's and, uh, presentation, that we're light years uh, uh, trying to turn this around. and. Uh, Whereas the labor movement has been historically supportive of the Zionists uh, in Israel, that this was uh, a glimmer of a change for our labor movement. Thank you. James. Uh, I just, a uh, few things I wanted to say real quickly is first of all, I wanted to thank Steve for bringing up something that I forgot to go into some discussion about. And that was the issue of like a, the Solidarity Center, USAID, um, working with and supporting Venezuelan migrants being part of the blockade. I just want to say that this is something that 
throughout NED and military and uh, diplomatic activities, especially military and like NED activities and USAID activities is basically disguising support for aggression or dressing it up as humanitarian aid, as support for workers, uh, <clears throat> as like a exercises in like rapid deployment for getting humanitarian aid to uh, difficult populations and for disaster aid. Uh, the, this is uh, the, the primary excuse for so many of the exercises that happen in Latin America. And in regards to the support of Venezuelan migrants and refugees who certainly need support, as uh, Steve said, the reason you know for the, the fleeing is the, block, the blockade and the sanctions. And uh, basically, the Solidarity Center is, when we're talking about Colombia and Peru, we're talking about the two, number one and number two, we're receiving uh, Venezuelan migrants. So what we're talking about is dealing with the excess for our allies of the result of the sanctions. So this is part and parcel of upholding the blockades and the sanctions, and that's what we need to be in. But I wanted to say, as far as like Venezuela and Maduro, we really need to think back to Iraq. You know, you like Maduro, dislike Maduro, have a problem with Venezuela's elections, or you're all in favor of elections. Let's remember a couple things. That whatever, for better or for worse, the situation in Venezuela is completely distorted by U.S. intervention and blockade and sanctions, completely distorted under the best of conditions. And let's remember that, for instance, in Iraq, whatever somebody thought of Saddam Hussein, I guarantee you that after two wars and 10 years of sanctions and blockades, Iraq is worse off now. You know, So I just want to say we can get caught up in looking at personalities and persons, but we need to remember our fight is against U.S. interference. And as U.S.ers, that's got to be foremost. And we've got to remember, why is the U.S. in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Latin America? It doesn't have to do with Nicolas Maduro. It doesn't have to do with any person. It has to do with that one-third of the world's freshwater resources, available freshwater resources, are in Latin America. Number one, Brazil, in the top 10, Colombia, in the top 15, Venezuela. That Venezuela has the largest of uh, reserves of oil. That's what it has to do with. It has to do with the transport, the Panama Canal, you know, the Amazon River. That's what it has to do, lithium in, in Bolivia, and the reason we oppose the U.S., hand, we, reason we say hands off Venezuela, same reason we said hands off Iraq, the same reason we say right now, hands off Latin America, and we need the Solidarity Center to speak for workers, not for the U.S. empire. Nice. We only have a couple of minutes left, so Ricardo, you want to end up? And then, and then I'm going to ask um, Jeff if he'd like to, you know, you know, finish up after you have something to say. Yeah, I just want to say uh, that uh, definitely, uh, you know, we have to uh, oppose uh, uh, Yankee imperialism throughout the, you know, world. Uh, you know, uh, in Latin America, actually, uh, in less than a year, in Argentina has been so-called visited by uh, Laura Richardson, the head of the U.S. Southern Command, to give support to one of the most uh, repressive and and, and, pro, and uh, uh, neoliberal uh, regimes in the world. They're uh, led by a lunatic called Javier Milei. And, uh, you know, it's uh, for the same reason that uh, the previous speaker has uh, said, uh, uh, you know, uh, lithium and uh, uh, so many other, you know, resources that are abundant in Argentina, actually, even the head of the CIA visited Argentina, which is uh, on press openly, which is uh, unprecedented that I know in Latin America. He went and met uh, with Milei and uh, all the Argentinian uh, government officials. 
So uh, definitely, uh, you know, victory to the workers of the world and U.S. get out of uh, everywhere that uh, you are, Yankee imperialist pigs. I, I just want to say that um, I appreciate everybody coming and I hope that if you appreciate what Lapayo is trying to do, that you get involved, that you go to our website, that we're having another forum October 26 on the history of Druid and the labor movement. And I mean, this is as crucial as any question. And we have to expose the American you know, labor movement for being complicit in undermining you know, workers' movements around the world and not only undermining, but help to murder people like, you know, um, Arbenz and, and, um, and, you know, just people around the, in Chile um, and supporting Pinochet. So, and this is going to grow worse as the American government is in decline. It's going to need more and more alliances with the American quote, labor movement, and we have to demand that they open the books, that we stop, you know, we demand that they stop the alliance with the American government, which is interested in overthrowing governments that oppose American imperialism, and that, you know, the debate continues about how we feel about any particular person. But it is true that, you know, the United States has to be stopped at this point, and that the only way that it's going to be stopped is when the, Ameri the American working class becomes aware of how it's being used and how you know the the working class is there to support oppressive regimes around the world. And the way to to stop this from happening is by educating people. And this is what Lapayo hopes to do. So please participate, come to our next forum, look at our website, spread the word, as Kim said, and, and you know, let's overthrow the, you know, the American government with the complicity of the, um, with, with the American, you know, AFL-CIO. Does anybody have any last, you know, words that they'd like to say before we end? It's almost seven. I think you asked Jeff maybe if he had a uh, funny, I, I did. I, funny word. <laughs> no, just uh, you know, thank you and solidarity. And uh, I mean, you. not to, not to be crass, but you know, read, read my read my book. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, well, also, I mean, I think we got to get your book out to unionists all over the country. Yeah. And uh, union conventions, we need to get resolutions to union conventions on these issues because the AFL-CIO has never opened the books on Chile, for example, and apologized to the Chilean working class and actually compensated the workers who've been killed. And thousands of workers were killed with the support, not just of the CIA, but the AFL-CIO. And I think that they have to be held accountable. And your book is part of, of making people aware of what's going on so people can be held accountable. If you don't have the information, it's hard to make people accountable. So getting the information out is absolutely critical. So let's work at doing that and getting it to union conventions. Uh, the CWA is gonna have a convention next year and we hope to raise resolutions uh, around uh, the AFL-CIO, the History Drute and uh, the relationship of the CWA to, to, uh, to the Solidarity Center. So let's do that as many unions as we can. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, take Good night. care.